Welcome to the uh, Venari podcast. My name is uh, Christian Owen and I'm joined here by uh, Dr. David Plans. David is um, original founder of BioBeats um, and is currently a uh, lecturer in um, psychology at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and basically today I thought we were going to discuss um, burnout, so particularly in, in men, you know, it's causality um, and basically what can be done about it with the use of technology um, you know, these days. I lecture in psychology, but my work is um, very much about why burnout exists and how to measure it. And so I've spent the last decade or so building tools um, in telemetry, which which really just means measuring from a distance. So using smartphones and wearables and stuff instead of um, bringing people into labs. Yeah. But that has given me a good sense of scale because the first app I wrote had over 220,000 users. So it was a good pool of people to to experiment with and very few people in neuroscience have that sort of reach. My whole interest came from my own catastrophic event where I had a heart attack early on that I recovered from, but I, um, but it was, it was essentially a, a, a cardiac event provoked by starvation and exhaustion at when, when all the tests came out. And I was really curious as to why somebody, you know, living above a supermarket in London could die of malnutrition, right? When, when I had enough money to buy food. Over the years, I've started to realize that in, in corporate culture in, in here in the UK, but also in the US and in, in, in many other places that we've looked at, burnout is really endemic, but there is still a lot of stigma involved, particularly in men. Yeah. You know, right now, I suppose in, in, in the period of human history, it's, it's, it's more common than ever before. Like, wh- why is that? It's a combination of things, right? We're measuring a lot more than we used to. So, of course, you know, in terms of mental disorder, yeah. we see a lot more of it, right? We didn't used to pay attention or measure at all. I mean, most psychological measures to do with anxiety or burnout are less than 50 years old. So it's kind of twofold effect. One is measurement, right? We're measuring when we didn't used to. But the other is the fact that before we had a lot of outlets for bad energy, for stress, right? We spent the majority of our, say, lifetime as a species evolving from being um, in caves and hiding in the dark during the night and then trying not to get eaten during the day and chasing things right for food and that's a highly stressful activity but also a very rewarding one right there's lots of downtime there's lots of release there's lots of violence so our bodies have evolved to to do that to um, run fast to keep running and to um kill things and we don't really do that anymore right unless you're a runner in which case you're less likely to suffer from burnout and that's that's why there's so much more because we're doing this we're sitting in front of screens and so we get the conflict of human interaction but we don't get any of the release Um, and that is um, another huge reason why it's so much more common now Mm -hmm. we're focusing more so kind of on, on on men here but it just tends to be more common in men why is that The truth of what we do to men is really quite horrid, right? We tell men from a very early age never to cry, never to moan, never to complain, always to crack on, never to look weak, and to always strike first, right? We then send them off to do horrible things, to do hard things, difficult things, with those rules in mind, which are essentially the rules of war. The problem is that when they realize that they're that they can't do that, that that's, that that's actually frowned upon, never mind frowned upon, that it isolates them, that it puts them in a place where they can't feel anything, um, it's too late. Yeah. And at that point, the only escape they have is, um, you know, often sadly suicide, or even more sadly, violence towards others. And typically that violence is inflicted on people who are nearest, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And near it tend to be family, their spouses, their children, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. I suppose you can have those like those wider f- effects on society because of that. What do you think? What do you think we do then from here? When you raise a startup, you look at the competitive landscape quite a lot, right? And mine was supposed to be an answer to a question, which is why do people burn out? Why don't don't people notice when they are heading for disorder, when they're heading for disaster, right? What I saw, what I find really interesting is that people still don't measure the body, not very much in mental health, right? And that's a mistake, I think. And this is what I think we should do next, is that if you think about it, all stress gets stored in the body, right? If you stress out a rat, children of that rat and its children, so grandchildren of the first rat, will exhibit symptoms of stress at the cellular level. 
right? So inherited trauma is a real thing. We carry it with us. That changes your reaction to how you stress. It changes your reaction to how you recover from stress. It puts you under a particular advantage and disadvantage set. So if you don't measure that, if you don't measure how the individual's body responds, all you're measuring is the assumptions we make societally about what stress is. So I'm going to ask you, how do you feel about this? Are you still interested in what you used to be interested in? Do you feel hungry? Do you, right? But those questions don't mean very much if I don't know what your body thinks. This is why we don't notice, right? There's something called interoception, which is your sense of the inner world. So hunger, need to go to the loo, thirst, stuff like that. It's the reason people bring food to funerals, right? To wakes, because people forget to eat when they're aggrieved. It's also the reason why people talk about broken hearts. Like your heart can literally break out of grief. It can go fully sympathetic and become almost autonomic, and that can kill people. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is think about digital health platforms differently and focus on how bodies change. Use data science and machine learning to understand patterns behind the conversation that body and mind have all the time and that most of the time gets disrupted. Yeah. Is, is there any, are there any kind of platforms or, or digital health companies out there at the moment then that, that are kind of providing that basically? Yeah, some people have tried, but we haven't gone anywhere near yeah. the sort of um, the level that I'm talking about. So like the giants like Headspace and Calm and people like Apple and people yeah. like Google well, and their health divisions, you know, they, they're looking at this data. They have looked at this data, yeah. but it's an exceedingly complex thing to try to do. Uh, it's partly why people like Fitbit who have probably the, the most, like the biggest set of heart rate and heart rate variability data that they could use, don't really release that data to the user. They focus on the things that human that humans in general can understand much more easily than that. Like how many steps did I take today versus yesterday? And yeah. do I weigh less than I did last week, right? They've, but they've still got all this data, haven't they? It's just, it's a shame that I suppose that they don't, don't use it effectively. Yeah, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. And it's also really hard to explain. I mean, we tried for 10 years. Like if I tell you your heart rate variability is not as high as it was yesterday, I then have to explain why that matters because it ma it doesn't mean anything. It's not yeah. a term that you hear in everyday life, right? Or is there anything that's like really effectively aided burnout in, in, a, in more of a kind of a facile way, basically? Yeah, so there's been attempts at doing this. I mean, Biobeats attempted to do that. Um, Welltree in New York, there are obviously, you know, companies like MindStrong that are looking at particular disease verticals, particular disorder verticals where they're using biometric data quite a lot. But there hasn't been a sort of more open way to measure burnout in, in workforces. But to do what I'm suggesting, you need live data. And that's a serious burden. That's why there aren't many people doing that. Because for a start, you need everyone wearing the same sensors, right? Yeah. And that's quite an Orwellian thing to ask a company to do, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. So, so it's kind of, it's difficult because the benefit could be massive, but the Orwellian barriers to it are also huge. Mm -hmm. The perception barriers are huge. It's difficult, right? I mean, apart from the fact that if I know exactly how stressed you are, no matter how good you are at concealing it, I could use that data against you in a number of ways, including barring you from promotion, right? Like imagine what would happen if we interviewed every CEO biometrically first, every CEO candidate, right? Yeah. I could immediately tell you who the closest to burnout are, right? And then you could do the real interviews with that in mind. It could be quite um, pernicious. It could be quite bad. Yeah, right? no, no, I, I, I can imagine. Um, yeah. And it's funny, like you say, with, with the Orwellian piece as well about like, you know, when it comes to medical data, people are often you know, become incredibly stringent, but at the same time, they're happy to kind of post everything on Instagram and they're happy to, you know, carry around an iPhone with them or a fit, you know, Fitbit or whatever it may be. It's just like, there seems yeah. to be like a weird divide in the way that people think about those two sets of, of, of data. It's because it doesn't really become important to them until it becomes a threat. Like yeah. people will not do what's good for them, even when it could save their lives, unless yeah. it is actively threatening their life already. Yeah, they'll put that data on Instagram if they're doing really well in fitness, or they'll put it on Strava and compare each other. Mm -hmm. But it's very unlikely that somebody's going to compare their emotional vulnerability profile with someone else's, precisely because the stigma is there as a wall towards not sharing that you don't want to appear vulnerable you don't want to appear as though you cannot manage emotion properly when you get to blue color it gets even harder because the stigma gets even higher i think it's our biggest challenge um, as a society right now is to undo the stigma and to provide huge value for people by putting the body first in measurement of this sort
yeah, I think transparency is probably key, isn't it? I really appreciate your time anyway. I think it's an incredibly interesting topic. I think we'll speak soon, no doubt. All right. Thanks very much for having me, Christian.